Hello there, welcome to my channel on chemistry lessons. This is BTEC Applied Science Unit 5 Chemistry and we're going to be looking at the January 2019 exam paper. So here is, your, you're allowed approximately 50 minutes on this exam and it covers those principles and applications of science to Unit 5. And as you can see, it's January 2019. First up though, if you don't subscribe, please do. Your support is very much appreciated and please take advantage of the likes and comments features. Let me know what we think. So here we have question one then. So question one is looking at aluminium and it says aluminium is extracted by electrolysis of alumina. So you should find a link appearing now for this video where I talked about the electrolysis and making aluminium. So if you want to have a look at that video first, you can. Otherwise, you can pause this video now. You can have a go at each question. And then when you're ready to see the answers, hear the answers, unpause the video. Right. Identify the chemical formula of alumina. Well, that's aluminium oxide. That's Al2O3. So it's the one right down the bottom here. Make sure I put a cross, Al2, O3, it's alumina. So part B then. So again, if you want to pause the video and have a go at the question yourself, go ahead and then when you're ready to hear the answers, you can unpause. The alumina is dissolved in a substance to form the electrolyte. Identify the substance. Well, again, if you've seen the video, we're going to dissolve this in creolite. So it's called creolite. We dissolve the aluminium in creolite. The melting point of alumina is 2072. Explain why it's dissolved rather than melted. Well, the reason it's dissolved is because that lowers the temperature. So when the alumina is dissolved in creolite, it reduces the temperature required, which in turn saves energy. So less energy is needed. And there's the mark scheme there. OK. So dissolving lowers the melting point. That means that less energy is needed and it reduces the cost. So part C, write the balanced half equation for the production of aluminium. So the half equation, that's the one where we show the electrons. And the half equation at the negative electrode, that's where electrons are gained. It goes from aluminium 3 plus plus 3 electrons to make aluminium. And that's worth two marks. And the final part to this question for two marks, explain why the carbon positive electrodes in figure one need to be replaced. Well, the reason they have to be replaced is oxygen forms at the positive electrode and oxygen reacts with the electrode. So they corrode and therefore need to be replaced. Question two. So this one is looking at, well, I can see already that there's some sort of enthalpy profile diagram. So I do have a video on enthalpy profile diagrams and that should be appearing um, the link on the screen now. And also this is looking at harbor process, which again, uses of substances, you should see a separate link for that appearing also. So when you're ready to have a go at this, pause the video, do the question. And then when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause. So, We've got some information about ammonia being made in the harbour process, and then it asks us to draw on the diagram. So this is one mark, draw on the diagram, the enthalpy profile when the reaction is catalyzed. So the difference between using a catalyst or not is going to lower the activation energy. Now I'm aware that on my enthalpy profile diagram, this is in fact the activation energy, but this is for the uncatalyzed. So how am I going to draw the enthalpy profile diagram? Well, the start and end are going to stay where they are. The only difference is going to be the reaction pathway will have a lower activation energy. So the whole point is that I've got a lower peak here than I did here. So I've lowered the activation energy. So part B then, which is the final part of this question, is worth four marks. So I'm suggesting you pause the video, you have a go. And when you're ready to hear the answer, you unpause the video. So explain the effect of using a catalyst in the harbour process. So it wants to explain, not just state. So what does a catalyst do? Well, a catalyst will speed up the rate of reaction without being used up. And it does so by offering an alternative reaction pathway with a lower activation energy. 
Specifically, in the harbour process, we use the iron catalyst. And the iron catalyst provides the surface for the reactants to bind to. So the reactants will adsorb to the surface, which weakens the bonds and allows the chemical reaction to take place. We then get our products desorbed from the surface. Now, I've said too much for four marks there, but any of those four points is what we're looking for. And you can see the mark scheme there. So I'm going to get a mark for mentioning that it speeds up the rate. I'll get a second mark for pointing out that it's an alternative reaction pathway. I talked about in this example, the iron being a surface. That's my third mark. And I mentioned weakening. And there we go. Um, you can see that you can go on and, and add more detail there. I'll leave the mark scheme so you can have a look at that. Um, and then we'll move on to the next question. So question three, sodium chloride is an ionic compound that dissolves in water. The solution contains aqueous ions. So we've now been told, right, okay, so brine is electrolyte. So it's about the electrolysis of brine. So here we go, there'll be a, a link um, to my video on electrolysis of brine. And if you wanna watch that first, please do so to, to get the rest of the information for this question. Otherwise, pause the video, have a go at the question, and then when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause. So for three marks then, at the cathode, hydrogen is formed, one mark. At the anode, chlorine is formed, two marks. And left behind in the solution is sodium hydroxide. So I've identified where hydrogen, chlorine and sodium hydroxide were formed. Part B, the equations for the standard enthalpy change of hydration for sodium and chlorine are shown below. Complete the definition. All right, so it wants me to complete the definition for the enthalpy change of hydration. Okay, so it's the enthalpy change when one mole of ions in the gaseous state, so this should be gaseous state, big clue in the question, are dissolved in water to infinite dilution under standard conditions, which are 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. Two marks. Part C then, worth three marks here. I can already see it looks to me like a Hess cycle. And I'll put a link to the Hess cycles for you um, there for the video on Hess cycles. And when you're ready to have a go at this question, unpause the video, well, pause the video, have a go at the question. When you're ready to see the answer, let's unpause. Okay, how do we do this then? So what have I been given? It's all about doing my little Hess cycle. So I've been asked to calculate this value here and I've been given these three values here. Right, what have I been given? I've been given from Na gas to Na aqueous and I've been given from chlorine gas to chlorine aqueous. Right, so gaseous sodium to aqueous sodium that's here i'm going to go up here for this value and that's minus 418 and it's one mole so i'll leave it as 418 chlorine um, gaseous to chlorine aqueous is minus 338 so that goes on this arrow and finally i've been given sodium gaseous and chlorine gaseous making sodium chloride solid so that's this arrow here going from sodium gaseous and chlorine gaseous all the way up to sodium chloride solid so this value here is minus 760. so what i'm going to do now is turn that into my fantastic hess triangle with my unknown value is across the top my delta hr this arrow is minus 760. And what I'm going to can do, what I'm going to do here is combine these two arrows into one. So I'm going to get my calculator and I'm going to do minus 418 minus 338. And my calculator says minus 756. Now to calculate X, I'm going to have to do my or apply Hess's law. I'm going to have my start and my finish here. Root 1 is equal to x. Root 2 is this way. 
I'm going against the first arrow, so that has to become plus 760, because I'm going against the first arrow. I'm going with the second arrow, though, so I do not need to change that sign. I leave it as minus 756. Put that into my calculator. 760 minus 756 is equal to plus 4. So my delta H is plus 4 kilojoules per mole. Next up, part D is worth three marks, and then we've got uh, part one is, is three marks, sorry, and part two is worth one mark. So this one looks like a calculation again, and I'll put a link um, up to find the correct video for this, but it looks like a Q equals MC delta T one at first glance. Now, have a go at the question, pause the video, and when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause. So they're, they're giving me the equation here, which is very, very nice of them. They want me to find the heat energy change, and it's going to be mass, and it must be the mass of the water. In this case, it's going to be 200, because centimetres cubed and grams, it's one gram per centimetres cubed, so I can just use centimetres cubed as the grams. So that's M, specific heat capacity is 4.18, and the delta T, it dropped by 2.5. So I'm going to put those into my calculator. 200 times 4.18 times 2.5 equals 2090. Now, got to be careful here because I know that's in joules. They're asking, look, for the energy in kilojoules. Would be a really easy mark to drop this. So in kilojoules, I have to divide it by 1,000 and I get 2.09. So be super careful with units, please. Moving down to part two, the student wanted to compare their experiment value against an answer that was calculated from literature data. One reason why their, their value would not be able or not be valid to compare, and that's because the literature values will be in kilojoules per mole and ours is just in kilojoules. Simple as that. OK, so literature values will be enthalpy changes, which will be kilojoules per mole. And we've only worked out the energy change in kilojoules. Next question is question four. And again, I'm suggesting you pause the video, you have a go. Uh, you will find a link to this topic, which is the um, halogenation of alkanes. So if you want to watch that video first, go ahead and come back and answer the question. And when you're ready to hear the answer, unpause the video. So alkanes can react with bromine to form bromoalkanes, alkanes, but only when exposed to ultraviolet light. Describe how ultraviolet light causes the reaction to begin. OK, well, what happens here is the UV light provides energy for the halogen, or in this case, the bromine, for the bond in bromine to break and become bromine free radicals. So it provides energy to form the bromine free radicals from Br2. I could even do an equation. I could do this. Br2 becomes 2 bromine free radicals. So the UV light provides the energy for that to happen. So part B, we're talking about propene reacting with hydrogen bromide here. And again, I do have a video that you can watch first if you wish, you'll find a link here. But when you're ready to have a go at this question, pause the video, and when you're ready to hear the answers, unpause the video and we'll go through. Okay, so addition of this HBr, well, we can either get HBr or the other way around. Bromoalkane X has got the bromine on the first carbon here. So all I need to do is show it on the second carbon. I can draw it at the top or the bottom, it really doesn't matter. So all I'm doing is putting the bromine on the second carbon instead of the first, because it can attach to either of these carbons here. And it has asked for the displayed structural form, so I've had to draw the full thing out. 
Identify the reason that propene is able to form two bromoalkanes. Um, okay, well, that's because it was asymmetrical. Okay, so it wasn't symmetrical. So symmetrical alkenes will just form one product. So it was asymmetrical or unsymmetrical. Identify the name of the bromoalkane in X. Well, it's propane and it's, remember, it's number one, two, three, but you can also number in reverse one, two, three. And we must go with the lowest number. So it's one bromopropane. Don't be tempted with three bromopropane because we go with the lowest possible number. So the last part to this question then, part four. Propane reacts with hydrogen bromide by an electrophilic addition mechanism. Yes, we've seen that in the video. During the reaction mechanism, a carbocation is formed. Yes, we saw that. The two possible carbocations are shown below, cation A and cation B. Compare the stability of carbocation B with carbocation A. So, suggest you pause the video and you have a go, and when you're ready to hear the answer, unpause the video. So, carbocation A is a primary carbocation, which is less stable than the secondary carbocation B. This is because carbocation A only has one electron pushing R group, whereas carbocation B has two electron pushing R groups and is therefore more stable. See the mark scheme there? I'll rub those things out because they've managed to block your mark scheme. There you go. So it says, we've identified that A was less stable, one mark, and that was to do with more alkyl groups on B. And then we've talked about electrons being donated or electron pushing groups. Okay, so there's our, our marks there. So this is the last question on the paper then. And the last question is always a six marker. They always do this. Okay, so I'm suggesting you have a go at this question. You pause the video and when you're ready to hear the answers or see the mark scheme, unpause the video. Okay, so we've got to talk about the advantages and disadvantages and it's notice how it's asking us just to focus on the hydration method. So it's a bit sneaky really because they don't want us to talk about the fermentation. They just want us to talk about advantages and disadvantages of the hydration one. Okay, here we see the mark scheme. So advantages of hydration, you don't have to get every single one of these down. So I'll talk, I'll talk you through how a six mark question works. So a six mark question is not about writing down six things. It's about answering the question. Sounds stupid, but the six mark question will always be linked to two or three things. In this case, it was two questions hidden in one. They wanted the advantages of hydration and the disadvantages of hydration. Didn't want you to talk about fermentation at all. So it's actually two questions. Talk about the ad advantages, talk about the disadvantages. If you've answered both parts correctly, doesn't mean hitting every single point, just means answering both parts correctly. So if you say you've got half of these explanations, as long as you've done advantages and disadvantages, you'll still get full marks. So that's called a level three response where you answer the full question. If you were to only talk about the advantages, even if you've got every single advantage on this list, if you've got every single one of them, you still can't get above kind of a level uh, level two. So you're going to get three or four marks, depending on how good it is. I mean, if you've got every point from one of them, you're going to get four marks. But you can only access level three, which is the five or six marks, if you actually answer the full question. Now, I'm not going to spend time reading all those advantages and disadvantages to you. You can see them on the screen there. And that's the end of the 2019 January paper. Hopefully that was useful and good luck with your revision and good luck with your exams.